Welcome back to 110 Lessons for Life from the teachings of the Commander of the Faithful, Imam Ali. May God's peace and blessings be upon him for infinity. Today in tradition number 59, we want to look at a very, very important and a very beautiful topic in terms of the spirit of worship. What is the kernel, the root of ibadah, of worship in Islam? You know, we have this entire religion of Islam, which is uh, broken up usually into three unique categories or distinctions. We have the theology, the aqayid, our belief system, which we know, in, you know is, is, is comprised of belief in the one God, belief in prophethood, and belief in the day of judgment. And then as an extension, we look at the justice of God as a unique aspect and the divinely appointed leadership, imamat, the appointed leadership after the demise of the noble prophet. That's one aspect of our religion. We have a second aspect, which is the morals, what we call the akhlaq, the Islamic teachings of goodness, of kindness, of all of the ethical, noble, moral teachings that the prophet has brought, which are in the Quran and in the Sunnah, the tradition of the noble prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him and his family. The third aspect or the third portion of religion deals with our practical day-to-day -day activities, what we call the ahkam, the fiqh of Islam, the jurisprudence. Things like praying, things like fasting, pilgrimage, charity, um, you know, doing good actions, keeping away from bad, loving those who love God, keeping away from people who do not have a love for God, the Prophet and the family, charity, all of these aspects, the sacred struggle, what we call jihad, all of these, the jurisprudential aspect is also a very important part of our religion. This aspect is what we want to look at today. What is the soul? What is the, what is the essence? What is the kernel of jurisprudence? Is it just washing the body, standing up, facing the Qibla, the direction of Mecca, praying, you know, going through the actions, the ritual, and that it, is, is that it? Or is there a kernel, is there a source, is there a, a, a point of reference for the actions? Before we go into the def definition and the understanding, let us reflect on the tradition from the commander of the faithful. And then we'll come back and try to analyze and understand our responsibilities. The commander of the faithful, Imam Ali, peace be upon him, says the following statement. Indeed, how many of those people who fast while they gain nothing from their fasting except hunger and thirst. And how many people stand in worship and gain nothing except for sleeplessness or sleepiness and tiredness. Glad tidings be to those with cognizance, whose sleeping and eating is better than the worship and fasting of others who do not have such knowledge and astuteness. Without a doubt, this is a very thought-provoking tradition that we need to probably spend you know, hours or days on our, in our own personal life reflecting upon. We know that God, Allah, is never ending. His mercy is never ending. His blessings are never ending. His pardon is never ending. Everything that emanates from God is never ending. All the goodness that comes from Him is unlimited in its scope. He then asks us to perform certain actions, pray, fast, charity, be good to your family, uh, be good to your neighbors, respect one another, deal with people with justice, all of these various actions that are within our religious ideology. And he promises to give us a reward. Now because he is never ending, his blessings are never ending, Theoretically, the rewards for these actions should also be never-ending, and that is a reality. However, when we keep that point in mind and then come back and think about this hadith, the saying of Imam Ali, peace be upon him, he tells us that sometimes there are people who pray and fast, and their fasting is nothing other than hunger and the pangs of hunger and thirst that they feel. And people who, there are, are people who pray, and their praying is nothing more than, to, you know, them feeling tired at the end of their prayer session with you know swollen feet and droopy eyes. So how do we understand this dichotomy? God is never ending, His rewards are never ending, but now we're saying that some people 
Do the actions, but do not gain that maximum reward. Why? Where is this disconnect? Where is that problem? Where is that um, separation? And how do we understand this? In these words of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali, peace be upon him. At level number one, what we have to understand is that, yes, God's blessings are never ending. His, his rewards are uh, more than we could ever even imagine them to be. But that doesn't mean that just because they are never ending and limitless, that we can automatically uh, be able to take in all of those blessings. You know, let me just give us a very simple example. If you have in front of you a 10 ounce glass and you have a 20 gallon jug or a 20 liter bottle of water, an empty bottle and an empty glass, you know, a little 10 or 12 ounce glass and a, and a 20 liter jug, you can never say in that 20, liter, 20 ounce glass of water that you could put 20 liters of water because it just won't fit into the glass. Don't blame the water, the water is the water. But the glass, the vessel, the container cannot contain that much. But that 20 liter jug on the other hand, you could pour 1 liter, 2 liters, 5 liters, 10 liters, 20 liters, and then it will become full. And if you had a swimming pool beside it, you could put thousands of liters of water in that swimming pool. It's not the fault of the water. Don't blame the water that it can't fit. No, the container is not adequate. One of the ways we understand this hadith of Imam Ali is in this way. Yes, God is giving the rewards, but we are not in that mode to be able to be receptive and accepting of them. Our spiritual heart is constricted. And so for many people, fasting in Ramadan is just fasting, is just keeping away from food and drink and smoking and relations with their spouse. They get nothing but hunger and thirst and, you know, withdrawal symptoms from smoking, from not smoking, but they don't get anything from the fast. There are people who pray, not only the 17 obligatory uh, rakat of prayers in a day, they do the 34 recommended Ramadan, they may do the 1000 rakat of salat, but they get nothing except for very tired, sore feet, callous feet, and sleepless nights. Why? If God promised a reward, why did they get nothing but tired and lethargy? It's because of the fact that we did not go and perform these actions in the correct frame of mind, as the commander of the faithful shows us in this tradition. Secondly, as the commander of the faithful tells us at the end of the tradition, that glad tidings be on those people who eat, obviously meaning outside of the month of Ramadan, but who break their fast and whose sleep is better than those who were fasting all day and who were you know, engaging in prayers all night because they gain the true maximum reward of these actions of praying and of fasting. So we see that there are times when there are people who their lack of worship, we can say, becomes much, much, much better than those who actually perform the acts of worship. There are people who might sleep the entire night in the month of Ramadan. They may break their fast. They may not even recite any of the recommended supplications. They just maybe broke their fast, prayed, did the minimal, and go to bed. And their sleep is better than that man or woman who stayed up the entire night in prayer. They may have just broken their fast and gone directly to bed after praying, and they are in a better spiritual state and a better level of proximity to God than that person who spent the entire night in prayer. Question is though, and let me end with this, is how can we get into that routine of making our worship in, you know, have that soul. How can our worship take on a soul of its own, a life of its own, such that we can gain maximum benefit, even from the minimal of activities that we may have to, that we may perform on a 24 hour basis? The one answer to this, and we'll end this discussion for today, although there are many answers and many ways to tackle this very uh, important question, is that as believers, we need to prepare ourselves for the actions. And I don't mean prepare just, you know, for example, with prayers, we make wudu, we have the, you know, the proper clothing on, we face the qibla, we've, you know, these are important, no, no doubt. But we have to really be prepared for each and every action. Very important at the level one is to know what we're doing. When we pray to God five times a day, do we know what we're saying in the Arabic? 
We have to pray in Arabic, no doubt. We cannot pray in any other language in terms of the five daily prayers. They must be done in Arabic. But the question is, do we understand what we are saying? Do we know the translation? Do we understand the, the profoundity and depth of the words that we are reciting in our daily prayers? When we go to Ruku, when we raise our hands in Qunut, when we go to Sajda, do we know what we're doing? Do we know what we're saying? Are we prepared for those actions? When we go for Hajj, do we just follow everybody because they're doing the same thing and we read a book, we just follow the manual like a menu in, in a restaurant, we do this, 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 this and this? Or do we really know what we're getting into? We have to at level one, brothers and sisters, friends, we have to know what we're doing, why we're doing it, why God wants us to do it. We may not have every answer today or tomorrow or for 10 years, but we have to continuously be progressing and asking ourselves this question of why do I do this action? Why do I fast in Ramadan? Why do I pray? Why do I go for Hajj? Why charity? Why, why, why? And when we get to the understanding of why God put these into our code of daily worship, then that is one of the ways to prepare to get that maximum reward. Another point, and we'll end with this, is that we need to prepare beforehand Right. Ramadan comes but once a year. You don't prepare for a 30-day regiment of fasting, of prayer, of spiritual upliftment the day before Ramadan begins. It's just foolish to think that you can prepare the night before and be ready. You know, people tell me that they cook for the month of Ramadan from a month or two in advance. The wife or the husband or whoever does the cooking at home, because we live in a society today where even men are cooks, uh, they'll cook maybe a month before and start to freeze little dishes, you know, of food to, to use in the month of Ramadan. People who, for example, want to participate in sporting activities, you don't train the day before, you train from weeks, months, years before the event. And so as believers, if our worship wants to be uh, elevated to that next level, we have to engage in preparatory stages way before the action begins. Right? Salat, the prayers, don't begin at the time of the Adhan. They should begin before the Adhan. We should be in wudu and purity. We should be getting in a focused mindset of what we're about to do. And then we pray. And so as we close in this tradition, let us do our best to gain the soul of worship, to truly get to the kernel of what worship is all about. And we will see that our praying, our fasting, our pilgrimage, our charity, every action that we do, We'll take on a new life, we'll take on a new vitality, and we'll have the energy and vigor and love and desire to perform these actions on a day-to-day -day basis. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.